Thanks, Shannon. I'm so uh, delighted to be here, and uh, thanks to all of you uh, who are here in person and those of you who are out there in cyberspace. Uh, I wish I could see you, uh, but uh, I'll imagine you in my mind's eye. <laughs> So let's get started because I have a lot of things that I'd like to get through and also make sure that we do have time for questions at the end. Uh, so a little bit about me, just to put uh, uh, myself in context. Uh, I have been a certified music therapist for over 24 years now. Uh, and over that time, I've had a wide range of professional experiences, uh, many of which involved end-of-life care and, and different kinds of bereavement support. So for example, I have facilitated music therapy groups for persons affected by cancer, uh, which included family members who lost loved ones. Uh, I worked on palliative care and dementia care units, uh, where part of my role was pre-loss and also some post-loss bereavement support. So for example, I would be working with a dying person on a musical legacy project, uh, something that they would leave for their loved ones after they had passed away. This could involve songwriting or musical autobiography, etc. Uh, sometimes I helped families to plan the music for their loved one's funeral, uh, or sometimes I actually provided uh, the music at the funeral uh, in situations where I had worked as a music therapist with the family and the deceased during the palliative care process. Uh, I've maintained a private music therapy practice over the years, uh, and individuals uh, sometimes come to me to work specifically on grief or bereavement, or sometimes they come for other reasons and issues related to unresolved grief, grief and loss emerge. So as a professor at Concordia, I teach and supervise music therapy students who do their stages or internships in contexts where these types of issues are often present. And since coming to Concordia, I've been able to be involved in interprofessional and music therapy specific research related to end of life care and bereavement care. So today's agenda, uh, we're gonna quickly uh, contextualize or define bereavement. I'm gonna provide an overview of music therapy in bereavement care. I'm gonna share a case example from my own work uh, and I'm going to uh, highlight uh, uh, share some highlights from a research project that I was involved in. So we'll go over a few definitions. So grief is the normal process of reacting to loss and it may be experienced as a mental, physical, social and or emotional response. The response may be influenced by previous experiences of loss or by circumstances of the loss. And research indicates that anxiety and trauma are significant factors in treating grief. Uh, and I want to make a point that today we're not focusing on complicated grief, as it is defined uh, in the DSM, uh, per se, but rather uh, we're focusing on the complexities of grieving as a normal response to loss. Bereavement is the period after a loss during which grief is experienced and mourning occurs. Mourning is the process by which people adapt to a loss, and this can be influenced by cultural customs, rituals, and society's rules for coping with loss. And although grieving, as I said, is a normal response to loss, it is diverse and complex. So models that outline how people grieve um, help to determine the needs of bereaved persons and how they might be addressed. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, the Kubler-Ross stages, uh, but the examples that I've listed here actually build upon or expand or change Kubler-Ross's work a bit, such as Rando's Six R's of Grief, which is a stage model, uh, Warden's Four Tasks of Mourning, or Strobe and Shoot's Dual Process Model of Grief, etc. So essentially, uh, these grief theorists state that people experience a range of responses following a loss, and we've come to learn that not everyone will experience all of these responses. Some mourners may move back and forth between stages or processes or tasks. Some may only experience certain stages, and there is no specific order. So what are the needs of bereaved persons? And this is not an exhaustive list, uh, but these are some of the highlights that have been identified in the literature or the models of grieving that I just mentioned previously. So individuals need time to work through a range of emotional responses and move towards acceptance and adjustment. 
They need to experience and express a wide range of emotions. Education about physical and emotional symptoms of grief can help to normalize the experience. People uh, need to know that their symptoms are normal and uh, it's not wrong if they experience their grieving process differently than another person. Uh, they need supportive understanding and listening within a group of peers uh, who are also grieving. This can be helpful for some. Physical release allows for discharge of hyperarousal, so physical manifestations of anxiety. Uh, and it, it's helpful for people to learn self-soothing strategies and or how to connect to an inner sense of calm, so breath work or mindfulness work, those kinds of things. So to address these needs, there are various types of support services that may be offered in community health care and end-of-life care contexts. And these services may be informed by a particular bereavement model or approach, like the ones, again, that I mentioned earlier. So there are grief support groups, and these can take many forms, peer support groups. They can be open and drop in. They can be closed, so limited to, to those people who registered. They can be ongoing for an indefinite period of time, or they can be time limited. Uh, there are professionally supported mutual help groups. So there's a, a professional there sometimes facilitating this uh, type of group. There are yoga or exercise-based bereavement support groups. There are expressive arts or arts therapies grief support groups. And there are two textbooks that I've listed there uh, published on this specifically. And then, of course, there are individual professional bereavement counseling or psychotherapy services that people can access. However, the literature and my experience and the experience of some of my colleagues that I've spoken with uh, indicate that when these types of bereavement support services are offered, there can be some limitations or challenges. So it may be that some individuals are not comfortable or motivated to seek out assistance. And usually, uh, females are more likely than males to seek out this kind of assistance. There are retention and scheduling challenges. Uh, mood fluctuation uh, affects motivation, so people may not feel like attending. Uh, some are not comfortable talking about feelings. So some people overall are just not, they don't talk about their feelings, they don't feel comfortable with that, or they don't like doing it in front of other people that they don't know. Uh, there are positive changes that can occur naturally with the passage of time, so not related to any kind of treatment or intervention. Uh, and in these cases, deeper issues may go unaddressed. So in other words, the person is feeling better, uh, so they do not seek out treatment or they discontinue treatment or support. Uh, and this is one of the factors uh, that can actually lead to complicated grieving processes when future losses are experienced. Uh, traditional grief support groups do not typically allow for hyperarousal or discharge uh, physical release of emotions. So um, often it is about talking. There's not necessarily a, a way to, to let go of the physical holding of the emotions that one is experiencing. Uh, the focus is often on verbal or cognitive processing rather than on experiencing feelings. So it's important to connect emotions to the body. Uh, and sometimes there are no words that really fit the experience of grieving or mourning. So before we talk about music therapy in bereavement care specifically, let me give you a little context about music therapy. Music therapy is a scholarly discipline and professional practice. Uh, we have credentialed practitioners here in Canada, they're called MTAs, who purposefully use music experiences and the relationships that develop through them to restore, maintain, and or promote health and well-being. There are many, many different types of music experiences. They can also be referred to as interventions. Philosophically, I prefer the word experience. Uh, and many, there are many used, but they fall under four main overarching categories. And those are recreative, so that's the use of, of pre-composed music, existing music in some way. Uh, the use of improvisational music, so that's, that's making up music on the spot. Uh, the use of composition or songwriting, and the use of music listening. So those are our four main overarching kinds of experiences with many kinds of subcategories that we have. Uh, and no musical background or knowledge is needed uh, to participate in these experiences and or to benefit from them. 
you may not know that the first official palliative care music therapy program, uh, as far as we know, in the world, uh, was established in September 1977 at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal. Uh, and that, that program is still part of the McGill University Health uh, Center system. So it, it, it still exists. So that is quite amazing. So we have a, a legacy here in Montreal around uh, this kind of service. So since that time, music therapists have continued to develop their scope of practice in end-of-life care, publish case examples, and conduct research. And music therapists are becoming more involved in post-loss bereavement work. Publications uh, and research are emerging, uh, but there is more needed. So what does the literature say about why and how music therapy might be used as a viable alternative or adjunct to other forms of bereavement support? Or how might music therapy address the needs of bereaved persons in unique ways? And today's focus, we're looking at uh, post-loss bereavement support for adults. Um, uh, post-loss bereavement support for children or adolescents who have experienced loss is a whole other area. Uh, today we're looking at uh, post-loss bereavement support for adults. So why music therapy in bereavement care? So music therapy has the potential to address some of the identified limitations or challenges of other bereavement support services that I mentioned previously uh, in slide six. For those not comfortable speaking or talking, music therapy experiences can facilitate nonverbal expression of a wide range of emotions. And song lyrics contain, contain symbolism and metaphor that allow for expressions of feelings, but at a safe distance. So a song can express something for you without you having to directly say it. Active participation in music therapy experiences, such as singing or vocalizing or playing instruments, can allow for that needed physical release of emotion. And participation in active or receptive music experiences, active being doing the singing or playing yourself, receptive being music listening, uh, this can create a pathway to access and experience feelings, and these go beyond cognitive processing because you are experiencing the feelings that the music is bringing up for you. And the enjoyable aspects of music participation can increase one's motivation to attend uh, a bereavement support service because you enjoy what you're doing, you are motivated to come. There are some other reasons. Group music therapy experiences inherently promote feelings of community, connection, support, and belonging. When you're making music together, those feelings just kind of naturally occur. Active music making can elicit positive changes in mood and help to synthesize physical, sensory, and emotional responses. Music is an inherent part of grieving in many cultures. Music therapists can collaborate with bereaved individuals to facilitate meaningful grieving processes through culturally relevant uses of music. And I'm going to sum this up by giving a quote uh, from a book written by Clemens Cortez and Varvis Klink uh, called Voices of the Dying and Bereaved Music Therapy Narratives. And they say music therapy is able to address and process complex issues surrounding bereavement and the pain of loss. Which also offering while also offering opportunities for strengthening intrapersonal coping resources and interpersonal connections along the path of grief. So I've given you some highlights from the literature as to why music therapy can be an important part of bereavement care, but to better illustrate how music therapy can be an important part of bereavement care, I'm going to share an example from my own clinical work. So as I mentioned previously, I have maintained a small private practice over the years. I have worked with a number of female clients who had lost a child and for various reasons were not able to grieve when the death occurred. And their bereavement processes were then put on hold. This was often over a period of years and this unresolved grief can take a toll on one's physical and mental health. An important consideration if we are thinking about healthy aging across the lifespan, as we do at Cregis and Engage. 
So today I'd like to tell you about Sharon. She was a woman in her 30s at the time that I knew her, and she had recently moved to Canada from a country in Africa. She was living with HIV that she had contracted from a blood transfusion that she had received when she was pregnant. As a result, she unknowingly passed HIV on to her daughter, Regina, who had died at the age of four from related complications. Her family did not want Sharon to talk about her daughter's death, and without her knowing, uh, she was grief-stricken uh, and ill at the time of Regina's death herself. Um, so without her knowing, they threw out all pictures of Regina and got rid of all traces of her existence. No one in the family was permitted to talk about her. As a result, Sharon was unable to grieve. It was not until she arrived in Canada a few years later that she actually found out that she was HIV positive and then had the realization that her daughter Regina had contracted HIV from her and that this was the cause of her death. Sharon was referred to me by a social worker who thought that music therapy might help her with her mood and symptoms of depression. When I asked Sharon what she hoped to experience or achieve in music therapy, she asked if I could help her to find a way to grieve the death of her daughter. Her grief and guilt were having a negative impact on both her physical and mental health, and she was finding it hard to cope with her day-to-day -day life. She was a single mother with a teenage son who she felt unable to care for. She didn't feel that she could be present for him. Over several sessions, part of our work together involved a songwriting and recording process. Sharon told me that this songwriting process uh, that we had in our music therapy sessions helped her to resolve the feelings of guilt and loss that were impacting upon her life and on her health. She reported improvement in her sleeping patterns and mood. She felt that it had allowed her to embrace her daughter's life and memory and that her own life could now move forward. She felt more motivated to take care of her own health and she had energy to engage with her son. Sharon is a pseudonym, it's not her real name, but she's asked me to use Regina's name when I present this material as it helped her to know that others will remember and know of her daughter's life. This song and the songwriting process helped to give Regina back to Sharon. It gave her tangible proof of her existence. And she was also planning on sharing this song with her family. So I'd now like to move on to uh, some highlights uh, from a research project on which I was co-investigator, uh, entitled Lived Experiences of Singing in a Community Hospice Bereavement Support Music Therapy Group. So this research took place uh, at Carpenter, Carpenter, oh, I can't talk. Carpenter Hospice, uh, located in Burlington, Ontario. Uh, which offers residential-based care and community-based programs within a family-centered model. The music therapist and my co-investigator, Adrian Pringle, works within wellness and bereavement supportive care group programs. So she works in the residential component of the program. In 2013, she launched what she called a singing well a clinical pilot project. So this was a, a singing group for bereaved individuals. And the format that she used for this pilot project was based on literature, and specifically on an article that I wrote on uh, music therapy singing support groups for persons affected by cancer that was published in 2009. And she also uh, consulted with Sarah Barbas Clink, who's another uh, music therapist, author who does uh, work in bereavement care in music therapy. Also, it's important to note that this group emerged out of family requests. They asked if they could have this type of group. They thought that singing felt good and that they could benefit from this type of group. So Adrian held 18 sessions uh, prior to the launch of our study in 2015. Uh, and she conducted a program evaluation. And the protocol that we used for our study was informed by the feedback we got from this uh, program evaluation. 
But the program evaluation actually did reveal that the program was working really well and that people were very overall uh, pleased with it uh, uh, and it was a really successful service. Uh, and a lot of people were registering and coming to that, that program. So if it was working well, why did we need to do any research on it? So there is a large body of literature on group singing and health, which indicates benefits for the general population, many of which align with identified needs of bereaved persons, those needs that we spoke about earlier. Uh, these types of benefits include things like positive impact on mood, uh, the immune system, decreased feelings of anxiety, sense of connection with others, increased feelings of motivation, etc. Preliminary research indicates that benefits of music therapy in bereavement care, which we reviewed on slides 9 and 10, can be realized uniquely through singing or voice work. So our inquiry aimed to build upon previous research and expand theoretical and practical knowledge about singing and bereavement. We also wanted to set a benchmark for provincial and national hospice music therapy services because we felt that a program informed by research in context, research in the real world, would lend credibility to the work that went beyond the positive feedback that we got from the program evaluation. We also felt that it would provide the participants who also feel disempowered by grief or loss with a form through which their voices could be heard. So we had a participatory action research component to this. So in summary, singing serves multiple biopsychosocial, spiritual and practical functions, a potentially valuable and unique coping strategy for bereaved persons, but we need more research in order to formulate best practice guidelines that can be realized in real world contexts. So the purpose of our study was to better understand how singing or voice work was experienced by adults who participated in a bereavement support group that took place in a community-based hospice setting. The term singing or voice work encompasses various means of creative vocal expression including breathing and vocal warm-ups, humming, improvised vocalization with or without words, toning, chanting, and singing pre-composed or original songs. We had a, con a convenience sample. We have seven Caucasian females, uh, ages 51 to 80 years old. We used, our methodology was interpretative, phenomenological inquiry. Uh, and in this uh, type of methodology, the uniqueness of each person's experience is of key importance. So we don't want to remove uh, any of the variations uh, of experience that individuals have. Those are, are kept uh, and accounted for. Uh, researchers' perspectives are also not discounted. So the researcher has some interpretive latitude uh, when they're working with the results and with the data. Uh, so we did an analysis of the individual cases, of seven cases, uh, and we then did a cross-case analysis where themes were identified among participants' experiences of the Singing Well group. So we had six singing groups that occurred over a period of three months. A flexible session format was based upon the music therapist's previous experience, uh, participant feedback from the Singing Well pilot sessions, um, and participants' feedback and request as the research process unfolded. Uh, participants were not forced to actively participate in any of these activities and were encouraged to participate at their own pace. So for example, they could listen and not sing. The protocol, again, which was flexible, essentially consisted of the following, a verbal check-in, breathing, relaxation, and vocal warm-ups, chanting or creating chants, vocal improvisation, sharing individuals' song compositions or meaningful songs, live or recorded, and group singing and selection of songs from a songbook that contained lyrics only uh, and a closing song. Participants could submit written feedback after each session, so that was optional but included as part of our data and most, uh, actually all of them did per, uh, submit some feedback after the sessions. Uh, we conducted, I conducted, the semi-structured individual qualitative interviews within 24 hours of the final session. So I met individually with each of the seven participants after their final session. 
and both Adrian and I, as co-investigators, made analytic memos throughout the data collection and analysis processes, and that was also part of our data. So we had a lot of data to work with. So the interviews were transcribed. Uh, six out of seven participants chose to review those transcripts to ensure that they didn't want to change anything about what they said and that we had uh, transcribed everything accurately. One individual did not feel like she wanted to, to review the transcript and that was fine. Uh, we did very detailed and rigorous qualitative analysis procedures. We don't have time to review them all today, but Adrian and I went back and forth and back and forth uh, with our uh, individual case summaries and our cross-case analysis. So we ended up, of course, because there were seven participants, with seven narrative summaries. Uh, and these seven narrative summaries represent explicit and implicit aspects of each individual's experience of singing or, vo uh, or voice work in this context. Uh, and then we had uh, the cross-case analysis resulting in overarching categories or themes. And these represent the group's lived experience of singing or voice work in this bereavement support music therapy group context. And so I would now like to share one of the individual participants' narrative summaries. Uh, and this, this study has been published, and actually there are some copies for those of you who are here over there on the table if you'd like to take one. Um, but the summary that I'm actually going to share with you is not contained in the publication because of space limitations. Uh, we were only able to include three of the narrative summaries uh, and we're trying to uh, decide what we're going to do with the other four. So I'm going to share one today that, that uh, nobody's ever heard before. So this is Lana's experience. Lana, aged 79, her husband of 55 years had died two years prior as a result of a brain tumor. She had been looking after him at home, witnessing his gradual deterioration over a five-year period. He was on the hospice waiting list, but ended up dying in the hospital. Lana felt bitter about this and decided to attend programs at the hospice to try and put these unhelpful feelings behind her. She attended a few bereavement support group sessions, in other words, talk therapy, but found it extremely uncomfortable to open up to others. She believed that her deepest feelings belonged to her and she did not want to share them. Lana decided to try the Singing Well group as she enjoyed music and thought that it might help her to feel calmer and more confident. Lana felt that attending the Singing Well group was one of the best decisions she had made since her husband's death. When she sang, she felt free and able to release her feelings. Songs that she had known all of, all of her life suddenly took on personal meaning, at times evoking feelings of sadness to the point where she was unable to sing. There was one session when she couldn't stop crying. Initially, she felt embarrassed, but then realized that no one was going to look down on her for sharing her sorrow. She felt accepted and understood. She chose not to contribute to the group songwriting project, believing that it would be emotionally overwhelming to hear her own words set to music. She was, however, deeply moved by the personal words that others shared, which often resonated with what she herself was feeling. She made a point of expressing her appreciation to particular individuals in the group for their song lyrics. She also enjoyed the humming improvisations where each person was free to do her own thing. This made her body feel less heavy and relaxed. On the other hand, she did not like some of the vocal warm-up exercises. There was one where you squeeze up your face like a lion and then let it go. Uh, uh, she said that this made her feel silly and exposed. She was glad that everyone had their eyes closed during these times. Normally, Lana was not a group person and tended to shy away from people. But in the Singing Well group, she felt safe. She learned how to go with the flow feel less annoyed by others, and have faith in them. 
She appreciated the talent, support, and humanness of the group members. She felt that Adrian, the music therapist, was an exceptional and good person, that she could ask her for anything. Not that she would ask, but it felt like she could. Lana decided that she was soon going to move on from the Singing Well group and allow someone else to take her place. She had been turning down invitations to various concerts and events because it did not feel right to enjoy life without her husband, and especially in front of others. But now, it was okay. She felt confident and ready to go on living her own life. So I'm going to give you some highlights from the group uh, cross-case analysis uh, of the categories and themes. Uh, in our publication, each theme is supported by participant quotes. Uh, so today I only have time to provide concise descriptions of these group categories and themes. Uh, there's definitely more detail in the publication, so please do pick it up if you're interested. So category one, the group singing experiences or the singing well context, help participants to foster a sense of connection with uh, and or increased awareness of themselves, their inner emotions, their voices, their breath, their bodies, other group members, they felt connected to the music, their deceased loved one, the here and now, and the future. These experiences evoked a wide range of feelings. They felt energized, uplifted, drained, sad, peacefulness, and well-being. The singing experiences helped some to express their inner feelings in a way that felt different than talking. Sometimes there were no words, or they felt that words alone were not sufficient. The singing group context gave participants permission to have fun and enjoy themselves. They felt free to explore their voices alone, together, to explore the harmony, the dissonance, they felt motivated to attend, um, and this group, almost everybody attended, except for, with the exception of one, all sessions. During the singing group experiences, participants felt accepted and not judged by others. They experienced feelings of compassion for each other. They felt that these experiences and the context worked well because the music therapist and the music therapy intern had unique qualities, skills, and abilities, which included flexibility, empathy, musical and creative talent, sensitivity, and compassion. They describe them as approachable, dependable, supportive leaders. As I mentioned, uh, as in Lana's example, the vocal warm-ups, uh, breathing and relaxation exercises had mixed feedback. Uh, for some, it made them feel exposed or self-conscious or they were bored with them whereas others expressed surprise and appreciation of the perceived physical and psychological benefits. Category three, songs reflected uh, participants' experiences of uh, singing or listening to pre-composed or original songs, and they indicated that particular songs reflected or validated their experiences of grief or loss. Sometimes it was the text, sometimes it was the music, Sometimes the songs were familiar and had associated memories. Sometimes the songs were not familiar, uh, but the text resonated with them in some meaningful way. Participants who had difficulty crying outside of the group were able to cry in the group in response to a song. And it was important for participants to be able to choose the songs. Perhaps uh, it gave them a sense of control or they may have had a personal connection with a particular song. They could even find meaning in other so others' song choices even if they didn't like the song that was chosen because they felt like they were supporting that person by singing their song choice. Uh, for some, writing an original song with the help of a music therapist provided a form through which they could express grief and share it with others. For some, it was emotionally overwhelming to think about composing a song, but they found meaning in others' song compositions. Category four, the improvised vocal experiences. These helped participants to feel free, liberated, emotional release, and experience physical sensations of floating or flying. They felt that they could be an individual with these experiences, but also felt a sense of togetherness at the same time. 
And overall, participants had a sense of commitment to the group, which stemmed from their love of music or singing, their relationship with the music therapist, or their previous experience of music therapy with their loved one, uh, and some expressed a desire to contribute uh, through research. For some, they became more musically active and initiated other activities or practices outside of the singing well context, musical and non-musical. Uh, it helped them to move forward in their daily lives. And during the interviews, participants sometimes struggled to find the words that they felt would adequately describe their experience of the group and the effect that it had on their lives. So we don't have time to go through this uh, in detail, um, but some of these selected implications. So one of the really interesting things I think about these results and, and the format of this group is that it's important to note that individuals' grieving processes uh, emerged organically. So we did not, uh, like other models, you work on particular stages or tasks of grieving and those are predetermined. We allowed those things to emerge organically within the Singing Well group context. Uh, and this actually happened to align, uh, and the article outlines this in more detail, with the dual process model of grief uh, and Rando's six R processes of mourning. And in terms of the dual process model of grief, what was happening was that individuals were able to engage in the singing experiences and sometimes they were grieving and sometimes they were seeking relief for those experiences, and they could get those things at the same time within the same music experience or different participants could actually be experiencing different things within the same music experience where they were vacillating between those loss and restoration orientations. Uh, singing as therapy. Uh, let's see, where do I have that here? Uh, this is where the singing experiences are considered as the main medium and agent for therapeutic change. Um, so this does not preclude verbal processing when needed, but participants enrolled in this group uh, because they wanted to sing and they seemed to have an intuitive awareness that that would be a healing process for them. So the music therapist must recognize then what it is therapeutically indicated to redirect the group back to the singing experiences and to consider which experiences may be indicated or contraindicated at a particular time for a particular group. Uh, they wanted to continue singing, but they wanted to do so outside of the hospice context. So there may be a need for some kind of transition group because they wanted to, to move forward in their lives, but they felt that this was very uh, a healthful thing for them. Uh, um, but it's hard to find a singing group that uh, does not require some kind of performance component, which people were not necessarily interested in, or um, uh, the uh, qualification of having a musical background, with this, which this group does not. So there may be a need for some kind of transition group. And that also aligns with uh, uh, the, health, the concept of health musicking, uh, where research is showing that there are, are positive health implications for the act of making music in everyday life, and that all individuals can benefit from that in multiple ways. Uh, there are some limitations of the sample which indicate a need for additional research, including that we need to examine the role of relationship with the music uh, therapist and the role of previous music therapy experience. So these individuals, not necessarily with Adrian, some of them came in from other hospices, but they all had experiences of music therapy with their loved one prior to participating in this group. So I think that gave them an intuitive understanding of how they might benefit. So the question is, how do we involve people that don't have a sense of how they might benefit from this type of group when in fact they might? So I'd like to very quickly end uh, with the words uh, and uh, uh, the closing song of the group. Um, and we'll give the last word to Yolanda where she said, in this group, we are soothing our hurt, opening ourselves up to new experiences and to the affection of others. We are singing ourselves well. All right. Oh, thank you. So I am ready, I think, for questions. Here's the reference uh, for the publication. I'll leave that on there for a minute before I put up my thank you slide. 